psychopathy is instrumental and an essential part of what's going on with Antifa, what went on with the communists, what's going on with critical theory, you know, what's going on in the universities. Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we are going to be talking about some resources you can use to figure out and understand what's going on in the world so you can kind of make sense of the madness. It's something we've been trying to do these last few weeks um, of the new year. So I want to kind of bring up some of the books that we've been reading again, maybe offer some online sources you can go to, some people on Twitter, maybe some YouTube channels. Um, but with a focus on a few books, well, seven books to, pr to be precise, that have come out in the last two years. So these books, um, I believe one, only one was published in 2018. The rest are from 2019 or 2020 or 2021, so maybe a bit over two years. We've talked about a few of them on the show before, but I thought it would be handy to have them all in, a, in one video. And as a reminder, maybe you either missed the video where we talked about a specific book or kind of forgot about it, and this can be a reminder that you might want to read this book. So maybe to start out with, um, we'll take a quick look at the latest one. We haven't talked about this one yet. It just came out. It is Unmasked by Andy No, Inside Antifa's Radical Plan to Destroy Democracy. So I've been looking forward to this book for a while. There aren't uh, surprisingly, there aren't very many good books on Antifa out there. Of course, you can go on Amazon and get the, what is it, the Antifa Handbook or whatever it's called, uh, the kind of manifesto and a few other kind of things. But there's really only this one as a kind of like journalistic account and uh, an academic one by a sociologist um, whose name is, I think, Vizosky. This, let me just check his name. I've got that one too. I haven't read it yet, but um, maybe we'll talk about that one. Yeah, Vysotsky, Stanislav Vysotsky. And apparently he actually did a a bunch of interviews and even kind of like on the ground stuff, like talking to Antifa members and really to try to get a an insider sociological perspective on it. So Andy No references this that book at least once in here, but like I said, we'll talk about that one if it if it uh, if it's any good but this one one of the values of this book is to it starts out just with kind of Andy Noe's journalistic um, overview of the events of pretty much the last year so the Black Lives Matter and Antifa riots and protests that went on and his background the the infamous event that kind of launched him into the wider public sphere, which was when Antifa attacked him in, I think it was 2018, and sent him to the hospital. Basically a bunch of people beating him on the street, and no one was held, account no one was held accountable, which is a pretty common occurrence. Um, he details the just the amount of violence and property destruction, of course, and the, the few murders involved, killings, and how little accountability there is for all these Antifa guys. Well, anyways, I just started reading this one. I haven't gotten all the way through it. But already, it's uh, <laughs> it's pretty eye-opening. Even if you followed the events like I did and read most of the news stories, it's good to have them all in, you know, all in one kind of account. And then he gives a history of the movement itself. And one of the bits I'm looking forward to that I haven't gotten to yet is some kind of documents that were like documents from inside the organization that kind of reveal how they operate and what their plans are and that kind of thing. And he talks about Chaz and how he basically infiltrated Chaz and was living there for a week or two until he was outed and uh, had to get the heck out of there. Because if you don't know, Antifa regularly calls for Andy Noe's death on Twitter in graffiti and once you realize what they're all about, you know, you, you kind of, you can understand why you'd want to be careful because they are not very great people, to say the least. 
But the reason to read this book isn't just as a kind of um, an inside look at uh, a group like Antifa and what they're doing, but there's a, there's a, a wider significance to what's going on and why they exist and what it says about what's going on in the United States. In Ponderology, which is the book that kind of um, holds all of these books that I'll mention together, he talks about ponderogenic unions, as he calls them, or ponderogenic groups. And these are groups that start for arguably a good reason. At the very least, they have um, they can start out with noble intentions. And over the course of years, that good intention and that original ideology the values and the aims that they have gets twisted and distorted over time. I know in the previous few weeks we've we've mentioned this, and I've said that even this even happens when the original ideology is kind of you know batshit crazy on its own. The same sort of thing happens, but with a group like Antifa, this is one of the kind of sick, uh, devious things about it is that you've that you the original ideology is anti-fascism. So who can be who can be against anti-fascism, right? And that's what they capitalize on. The fact that you can't be, or the fact that no one wants to be a fascist, because obviously fascism um, is something most people don't want to be, practically all people. So they are able to set up this dichotomy of you're either with us or against us. You're either an anti-fascist or a fascist. So if you don't agree with our perspective, our our ideology, our aims and goals, if you're not explicitly supportive of us, then you are what we are um, designed to fight against. And that follows a standard pattern. One of the things that Lobachevsky points out is that the... Well, he points out that when you have an ideology like this that has been perverted, that has been that has gone off the rails to some degree, the reason that has happened it has been has been because of the growth within the ranks of people essentially with personality disorders. He calls it a a ponderogenic union, as I mentioned, and distinguishes between t- two types of ponderogenic groups. That is, groups that lead to the development of and genesis of evil social evil, you know, criminal evil, that kind of thing. And he distinguishes between a primary and a secondary union. A primary ponderogenic union is like a gang, a mafia, the mob, um, a, you know, a group of bandits, a, a, a tightly knit group of people with a criminal goal. And most societies, or pretty much everyone in a given society, sees those groups as criminals and doesn't support them wouldn't, you know, elect them into office, for instance, if they ran as a political party. But you also have these secondary unions. Secondary unions are the ones with social, with social aims and goals and a, uh, an ideology which people in general, or at least a, a, a large segment of the population, would and do support. So if you have an ideology like anti-fascism, um, naturally, people just seeing the, seeing the name hearing the, the outer layer of propaganda would say, okay, that's a good thing. And you can get pretty massive support if, you're, if you are essentially hiding behind a good cause. But as a group has more and more pathological individuals, people with personality disorders, then that's, that's essentially what shifts the, the inner dynamics of the group so that that ideology then becomes a mask over a criminal enterprise so it would be like it would be like the mob running on the democratic ticket or something or the republican ticket and so they have the the power of not only tradition in that case but of the the support towards an ideology or group that has a support for them from a large percentage a large percentage of the population which acts as cover, essentially, for something else that they want to do. So they might say here, it, well, it's, it's, it's pretty, it resembles a typical politician in the sense that 
they have what they say to the public, you know, what they want to do and what, what then what they actually want to do. Um, but there's an even, there's an even more sinister element to it because a, a, a secondary ponderogenic union, their goals are to achieve political power to radically change society so that they can essentially do whatever they want. They can reorganize society to, uh, to benefit them in their own interests. And how that happens historically, you can just look at, well, fascism and communism in the 20th century to see how that actually plays out. When a group, of, uh, when a group like that takes political power, there is a radical restructuring of society. And as, you know, as James Lindsay likes to put it, it the humanity, the society gets put through the meat grinder, through the blender. That's typically what happens. So when you look at a group like Antifa and the amount of support, whether explicit or implicit or tacit, and the, the cover that is run for them by mainstream politicians, and then you look at what they actually do and how they do it, they are essentially a, a criminal mob that is hiding behind an ideology of anti-fascism and using that as a way to radically restructure society, and if they had their wish, tear it down completely to replace it with their version of a uh, you know utopian vision. And I don't want to uh, jump into um, like I don't want to sidetrack this too much, but it's it's an interesting facet of um, well wokeism in general, but but then specifically like the anti-fascist movement where it almost seems from the get-go like a ponderogenic union. Like it's, it's like it's almost a primary in a sense, uh, or at least very close to um, by the time it's already like coming to the stage and, and doing all of these different things. Yeah, well, that, and that could be like, that's why I'm interested to read the, the, history, of a, the history of it because I don't know the, the total history of it yet, but it started in Germany, I believe. You know, during, um, in the 30s, I think it was, as a reaction to, as a communist reaction to the rise of the Nazi party. So it was, so it's had almost a hundred years to evolve. Yeah. And it could even be that by the time that, um, it's American branch started, you know, mm -hmm. it, it was already, you know, far gone. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know that uh, I mentioned, I did have Vysotsky's book on Antifa. I did read the first few pages of it and like any good, uh, um, uh, well, sociologist, I don't know if he's a very smart person yet, but he, he basically presents, he's trying to, pr or he does present like the scientific academic view, right? So he says, these are their goals. Their goals are anti-fascism. And so what they do, their, their goal on the streets of America is to fight fascist elements like on the far right and et cetera. So that's their, that's the, 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 that's their explicit goal and their explicit ideology. What Vysotsky hasn't mentioned, but which, you know, Andy No and any number of um, commentators on Antifa point out is that, well, what's the definition of fascism that they're using? Their definition of fascism is you're either an anti-fascist like us or you're a fascist. There's no in between. So, so anyone who doesn't, doesn't agree with them is a fascist, whether or not you're a fascist. Yeah. It's the same thing with, uh, that's what's, that's how all of these word games work. Like, uh, like misogynist, racist, there are real misogynists, real racists, and there's everyone in the middle that can be called that because they don't agree with a tiny radical fringe group who, well, they're not so fringe anymore, who have massaged the language in such a way that pr practically everyone who isn't them can fall under that label. So, yeah. So if you don't agree with Antifa, if you don't agree with their methods maybe, then you could be a fascist too. Just like when I mentioned that when he was in Chaz, um, one of the Antifa, you know, people pointed him out. He's got the picture of her, you know, pointing at him. And, and, and what did, what did she say? I think she said, um, something like that's, that's Andy. No, he's a, he's a known fascist. Um, <laughs> something like that. Like let's get him or something like that. And I mean, Andy knows not a fascist, uh, obviously. But to, to Antifa, he is. To yeah. Antifa, anyone that exposes them or 
criticizes them mm -hmm. is fair game. So it's interesting too that uh, I think it just came out like today where uh, the the female like lead publisher or something for the book her et his editor his editor yeah his editor got fired mm -hmm. for having simply con conservative viewpoints which of course has been redefined uh, <laughs> along these political word game lines to to be that she is a fascist but you, you know that's that's just because they massage the word and not because she actually is and so it's just an, it's an interesting thing and i think points to uh the fact that we should read this book because it, they <laughs> obviously don't want it to get out yeah and um in portland where no is from there's a a famous book bookstore can't remember the name of it in in portland and when the book was about to be released, there were um, protests, calls on Twitter to for them not to stock this book, not to sell this book. And the, the bookstore had to shut down for a period of days because of the protests. And, uh, of course, calling it, uh, we can't, uh, what were the words they used? Something like, you know, this bookstore, we, protesting this bookstore for potentially selling this far-right, you know, fascist racist book or something like that which is completely well it's completely not complete nonsense it basically shows that yeah they don't want people to read this book not only do they not want people to read it it's it's more it's more than that because they know people will read it it's just a statement that um that they can they can use their their power to shut down this bookstore and to stop them from from selling this book by one of their declared enemies mm -hmm. and and Andy No is one of their enemies. I mean, you can see why because he uh, he does expose them, exposes what they really like. So maybe I'll just read um, just a couple things about, about this is in the in the Chaz chapter. So I'll just read a paragraph. Maybe one glaring blind spot in the mainstream media coverage of Chaz was how the space gave platform to violent ex extremist ideologies. Reports about Chaz's political agenda focused shallowly on racial justice and defunding the police, rather than its explicit calls to kill cops and overthrow the government. Hundreds of graffiti messages and images lined the zone showing dead pigs wearing police hats. One of the messages read, No work, no cops, end this stupid effing world. <laughs> Voting keeps you tame, all politicians are the same. Um, but I, I like that one. Okay, now that now they were handing out a booklet um, titled Against the Police and the Prison World They Maintain. It features short essays on why police, capitalism, and the state must be destroyed by any means necessary, including through violence. One section explains how the media are enemies used to pacify re revolutionaries. The booklet reads, Our contempt for the media is inextricable from our hatred of this entire world. <laughs> So, Jeez. like, kind of the definition of psychological misfits, yeah. um, the, like, a total, total misanthropy, uh, a hatred of humanity, and yeah, they essentially they want to tear the effing world down. the The entire world is against them, and you know, where where does that come from? What have we What have we learned over the you know the past few weeks, and from all this other stuff that we've been looking at, especially. Um, uh, James Lindsay's recent article is that who who views the world like that the the world is evil well uh, most of the most most people who come to those ideas on their own who don't um, essentially get brainwashed into them by other people are people with certain types of personality disorders the world is out to get the world is out to get them the world is inherently flawed in such a way that they cannot function in this world well why can't they function in the world it's because they don't they don't fit inside of it it, it um the the world isn't set up in such a way that they would be that they would or could be happy. Yeah, that's the uh, like you were saying. It's an extremist viewpoint that unless, like you were saying, the only way somebody of a general, uh, like more or less normal person would come to that conclusion is through brainwashing. Mm -hmm. Because if you if you're looking at it from you know a normal person's viewpoint, it's like yeah, there's a lot of things that are screwed up, but it's not like a fundamental nature of reality itself that it is against you mm -hmm. unless you have some severe psychological trauma. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're on the uh, other side of the spectrum from the normal person and you are completely pathological, then yes, 
uh, the world is out to get you because society wants to find out who you are so they can selectively, you know, mm -hmm. uh, put you in a place where you can't do harm to the rest of society. Right. Yeah. So that's why, that's why a couple times in the last month or two, I've, I've, I've made the comparison to serial killers because it really is. It's like, um, the mentality of a group like this is like the mentality of a serial killer that they have to, first of all, they have to put up this mask. They have to hide from the world. Um, and they do that with, with their black block, their, their masks and, uh, to, to try to avoid exposure whenever possible, even though, even when they are exposed, nothing happens to them, but they have to use again, the ideology as a mask to be able to pull the wool over the eyes of the people who aren't willing to put in five minutes of research to find out what's really going on or just watch them destroy city blocks. Yep. They need that, uh, cover that, uh, that sheep's clothing to, mm -hmm. to pull over the people's eyes. What, how did Lobachevsky put it? Like the romantic notions, uh, where they would, they have to romanticize the things that they do in order to justify them. Mm -hmm. But when you remove the romanticization, yes. You do when you do the striptease, uh -huh. uh, you just reveal the pathology for what it really is. Right, and he pointed out there's a that's a good passage in there because he said something like that, and then that's a painful process even for like for a psychopath because when mm -hmm. a psychopath's mask is revealed, then they're exposed. People know who they are; they can't hide anymore, and that's what that's usually the only time that a psychopath will commit suicide was when he, he knows his you know the, the jig is up. The jig is up. But Lobachevsky points out that it's not just psychopaths that are bothered by that, that normal people too have a negative reaction to having a, an ideology like this exposed. It's, uh, it it, provo it promo uh, provokes a bit of cognitive dissonance, I guess you could call it, to have, the, to have the romantic notion stripped away and to see the bare pathology underneath. Mm -hmm. So people don't want to know the truth. It, it's it makes them uncomfortable on a very fundamental level to to see a a group with a good with a an ostensibly good and decent ideology is exposed as a bunch of like raving criminal psychotics and psychopaths mm -hmm. um it's 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 uncomfortable it's disconcerting but that's really what's going on that the the like antifa is not an anti-fascist organization they are not like there's there's nothing anti-fascist about them. It's in name only, and even then, in well, yeah, name only. I'll give them that. Yeah. And so to to expose that, to just expose them as a as a bunch of hoodlums, essentially, is even makes ordinary people uncomfortable because they want to hang on to that that vision of uh, of anti-fascism. Same thing with communism in general. Like people. Uh, even even today, you have communist apologists who uh, who make excuses for any of the the communist failures of the twentieth century, and but to just to just it, it's not I don't, I don't I don't see what the problem is. Just <laughs> they're a, a bunch of idiotic psychopaths who did all who did untold damage to their own people and the and like the entire planet. Um, and yet the people that are so uncomfortable about, this is just a pet peeve, the people who are so, so uncomfortable about exposing the, the nature of the, the people behind communism, put it that way, are totally willing to, to point out the, total, the totally inhuman nature of like imperialist wars, for instance, of like the, the Western world and NATO and the United States killing hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of people. That's, mm -hmm. that's evil. But when you have, maybe it's the ideology thing, because... Because as ideolog like as much ideology as there as there is behind like the American government or the Western world, they don't have an ideology in the sense that that the communists did and do, in the sense that Antifa does. Mm -hmm. So maybe it is that element that element of the ideology that that acts as that cover, so that people can will still even critics of you know Western imperialism who you'd think would be able, would would say oh well yeah the, the communists were really evil too even though i hate the, the western world but no there's something something about communism that's just like oh, I, I don't want to make fun of it or i don't want to criticize it because they just want a better world right they just want to make the world a better place and that's i think kind of where maybe some of this comes from within the west as far as like a 
it's a it's an aspect of liberalism within the West where we give each other we give each other a lot of rights, right? You know, we give each other property rights and, and due process of law and all of these things. Basically, one of the fundamental ideas is that we assume the best in people. And so whenever you present an idea, one assumes that you're actually trying to do good. And I think that there is a lot of internalization of this idea. Um, and that could be why there is this... Uh, this re this revulsion to taking that position that this isn't about making the world better mm -hmm. period full stop yeah. get over it yeah and i, I want to try to figure that out uh, figure that out in regards to a massive war so if you look at the iraq war which was um cuz you could make an you could make an argument and of, and of course people have made arguments that war is good for various reasons that war is making the the world a better place, even though it's it's uh, it's hell while you're doing it. Yeah. But I think maybe the reason that that doesn't apply in that situation is because war and its destruction are obviously not or, and can't be ex uh, and can't be what's the word rationalized or made made an excuse f or or an, an excuse for them can't be made by saying that it is the an unintended consequence that a whole bunch of people die. You know, when tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people die, you can't say, oh, well, you know, that really wasn't what we intended when we invaded that country and got into a massive war with them. Um, so it's kind of blatantly evil, mm -hmm. like the level of mass destruction. But with an ideology, you can say, well, we were trying to make things better. We tried. We tried. It just didn't work out very well, and and millions of people ended up dying. Yeah. <laughs> Like, but we didn't mean for that to happen, so you know, yeah. cut us some slack. And so you can have it from two sides, too. You could have like the people within the party, let's say, who are like, you know, we really did try, but, you know, those darn fascists, they, they kept yeah. screwing yeah, stuff the, up. The counter-revolutionaries. The counter-revolutionaries, they just kept, you know, throwing kinks, you know, mm -hmm. wrenches in the works. And, and then from the other side of it, it's like, uh, you know, the apologists, I guess you could you could call them. Uh, would just you know make excuses like oh they you know they tried but you know he wasn't really as smart as he needed to be he he couldn't have foreseen this that or the other mm -hmm. uh, situation come down uh, the pipe or whatever. Yeah, but really, they had just had good good intentions. Yeah, and I guess anything is excusable if it you had, had good, good intentions. intentions. And it's hard to make the case for good. It's harder to make the case for good intentions when you invade another country and get into a massive war with them. Yeah. So uh, maybe that explains that. Um, well, okay, enough of that book. We'll get through a few of these um, in a quicker fa fashion because we've already spoken of them, but I just want to remind you of them. But first, this one I mentioned last week, I think. This is Arthur Kessler's Darkness at Noon. Now, this book, of course, did not just come out in the last few years. It was originally published in 1941, but this edition came out in 2019. This... Um, well, for anyone that hasn't yet heard of this book, if you like 1984 Animal Farm, this should probably be on your bookshelf right next to them because it's also a classic, but um, less well-known than Orwell. But the this is a new translation based on a new manuscript that was discovered in 2015 um, in Germany, so of the original German manuscript. So... If you've already read it, then that's an excuse to, to read it again and to, in its most pristine form, if not in German. Um, and if you haven't read it, then it's a good chance to check it out and read it for the first time. Um, if you don't know anything about it, it's basically a, a very thinly veiled account of the show trials of the 1930s, um, where the a lot of the original communists... I guess you could call them the first wave of communists were uh, eliminated by Stalin. And yeah, I'll just leave it there. It's a great book. So check that one out. So if you want an idea of how things were in the past in novel form, then mm -hmm. uh, check that one out. Um, move on. Of course. Okay, I'll get through the ones. Let's see. These are the ones we've already talked about. Yeah. So again, check out 
Cynical Theories by Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. Very worth it for understanding the ideology that's going on, um, the, the background of the kind of the philosophy that has led to this book. This book focuses on the postmodern elements of the philosophy that have led to critical, what you know, critical race theory, social justice theory. Essentially, what you see whenever you turn on the TV or read the news or enter a university today, mm-hmm. or any corporate environment. So, <laughs> if you want to understand the entire world, yeah. then you can read this book. That was, uh, and I've only read, you know, part of it, but uh, I got kind of the same impression of postmodernism and critical theory uh, that I got from, you know, what we were talking about earlier with uh, Antifa's, Mm. you know, statements and all that stuff and Mm -hmm. it being like basically uh, almost like a a primary ponderogenic union, like at the onset. Um, So I was wondering about that, but now that we've talked about it a bit, the ideas actually start with the Enlightenment, so it's actually had a long time to to actually uh, adapt and get uh, transformed and ponderized. Yeah. Uh, to get to uh, the what was it the sixties and mm-hmm. uh, Derrida and Foucault and all mm-hmm. them. Well, and even um, <clears throat> I think even a lot of the original postmodernists, it's hard to say what they'd think if they were transported into the to the present or like. 10 years into the future, um, I think that they would probably be horrified too. They just wouldn't realize, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be immediately apparent to them that they were responsible for it. Yeah. <laughs> because that's the way that cynical philosophies tend to work is that you get this, um, you know, a very smart philosopher who comes up with these great ideas that are great in his own head, even if they make sense to very few other people, that then, um, have their effect on the world and they have that they have that effect because they are at odds with reality when you have a philosophy that is at odds with reality it will clash with reality and that clash usually takes the form of massive destruction and death and subjugation so so i wouldn't i I wouldn't even think that uh like because a lot of these philosophers they they're they're just academics writing writing their tomes from their you know, mm-hmm. university office desks. Um, a lot of them weren't on the streets, co- you know, working behind the scenes trying to topple governments and um, and defund the police. Like they, they they had lofty ideas, right? It's their um, it's their influence on the actual movers and shakers, the people on the ground that that gives them any kind of um, power. Like if they just read their books, wrote their books, and no one read them, nothing would happen. Like these guys are, I mean, they're just academics. Mm-hmm. But it was through, um, you know, I don't have I don't have all the ID, all the details. I wouldn't be able to give a comprehensive account of why it actually happened. But through the through their influence on their own students and being widely read, that influenced an entire culture and created something even wider. Because um, you could even see how you can see the you can see the good intentions behind even a lot of the postmodernists and a lot of the early um, like disciplines that have that led to the kind of caricatures that we see today in like women's studies and, and race studies and all these kinds of things. You can see the 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 inspiration that like the motivations behind them, which is why um, which explain why people can support them today is because they were founded in something that everyone can kind of get get behind, which is like. Don't treat women like animals. Don't judge people based on the color of their skin, um, etc. And people should be treated equally. In in yeah, people should be treated equally, mm-hmm. essentially based uh, you know, or at least not be not be unequally treated based on something like race or gender or yeah. whatever. And in some sense, uh, rules are just arbitrary. So you know we can play with them. It's not mm-hmm. uh, unsanctimonious. To, to question certain uh, rules and things. Mm-hmm. Uh, l- like one of the uh, presentations that I saw of uh, French postmodern uh, film and the effect that that had on the movie industry is pretty profound. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because before the, the French postmodern film era, things were very structured, very rigid. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whenever somebody was traveling, you had to show them traveling. 
and you know the the French postmodernists were like, why? Mm-hmm. Like, wh- why can we not just assume that they'll get it? And so you know they did all of these playful things, playing with the rules, mm-hmm. and and you know broke down the structure in a, in a good way. Yeah. And so it did have some some useful utility mm-hmm. there. Um, but then you know the uh, the other side of that coin is when you just question everything to ad infinitum, mm-hmm. then you're just kind of like you know this is a it's like a two second clip of a of an apple just yeah. sitting on a table and it's supposed to be profound and it's just an apple. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like dissonance in music. That's kind of the way I see postmodernism. Is it's uh, it's the, the the devil's tritone, the, de- <laughs> the devil's interval, uh, or just uh, very atonal aspects of music which if you know anything about music music needs a little atonality a little dissonance in order to make it work that's how you get the a coda like the resolution to a song um but there's uh, like there's a degree to it right so of course the postmodern music um to totally destructure or de uh, what's the word deconstruct totally deconstruct the entire structure of like western music then you get stuff that most people don't consider to be listenable because it's so atonal and so dissonant. Um, and that would be like kind of the equivalent of an apple, but maybe a cubist apple um, that's like, you know, refracted through something. So it's just a blob on the screen and you can't tell what it is. And then you show that for, for 30 hours you yeah. know, or something. Yeah. So th- there's, there, there's kind of a spectrum of the, the, the application of postmodernism to, to something. But like you said, there, there are, there's some good to do it. There's some good that comes from it where you can be playful with it and experiment and find new ways of doing th- th- doing things so that you don't need to show, you know, people traveling from place to place all the time. You, you know, people will get it. So that's kind of one of the ways that I, I see postmodern philosophy is that while it's wrong in so many ways, like every, I, everyone, I think, will agree that, they're, that postmodernists can make valid criticisms a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So... So yeah, I don't see the, the the original postmodernists as like these evil sons of bitches that uh, that um, like I would a lot of other people, but but they were wrong about very important things, and the influence of their ideas has led to things that are much worse. And uh, some of the primary things they were wrong about is that they were they, they like they they're just they're complete anti-realism. That there's no possibility of objectivity, um, or that it's, or they they have this weaselly way of of getting around that. Like, uh, really, their philosophy says there's no. If you if you take their philosophy and take it to its logical conclusion, it is totally relativistic, and there's no objective truth. But they'll say, oh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that any any whenever you any, anyone who makes a truth claim who claims that something is true that mm-hmm. there there are that the the that that ha- that can't be interrogated without looking at the context that goes into their 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 truth claim and all of the all of the the socialization and and mm-hmm. you know all of the extraneous ideas and the oppression and the and the power that goes into that statement so well okay so is it true or not you know <laughs> that's what most people are concerned about well is it true or not okay yeah there might be some power dynamics involved but we can look at those but is it true or not that's the primary thing that most people are involved in it's like can i eat this yeah. Can, can I eat this? Will it will it sustain me for the next day so I don't die? Is it raining outside? Right. Is it raining outside? So, the, but the, <laughs> but the, you know, you can just imagine the, the, these postmodernists. Is it raining outside? Well, I have, have to question the, the the power dynamics behind your your statement, your assumptions. Yes. You're, uh, uh, so it, there, it's it's really a lot. A lot of it is really just language games. But now you see. Even though, even if they would claim that, oh, well, we're not really anti-realists. We don't really believe that two plus two equals five, or that it's not raining outside when it clearly is. Um, now you can see the the result of that kind of relativism and that kind of anti-realism in the world, where, well, just yeah, yeah look just, around. just look around. <laughs> um, so, yeah, is that enough on cynical theories? Maybe. Well, the oh yeah, I, well, go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to say I mentioned that this focuses on the postmodern elements. Um, what they cut out of the book because it would have been too long is the actual critical theory guys, like Marcuse and and then like Gramsci before them and Horkheimer and 
Adorno and all that. So if you want to learn a bit of that, then you can just go to new discourses and like, you know, listen to some of James, James Lindsay's podcasts and, uh, and follow him on Twitter. Cause that's where he's talking about a lot of that stuff. It wasn't in the book. Uh, so I guess what I was trying to get at earlier then was that, that, um, distinction or not even a distinction it's not like there's the playfulness of the postmodernism uh postmodern ideas and everything but it's 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 when they started to get into the 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 fundamental assumptions of there being an objective reality mm -hmm. and questioning it without questioning it that's when i'm starting to get like okay something's not right here yeah they're they're totally detached from reality like in a certain sense mm -hmm. you know i think that's and a lot of them motivated by some kind of like are they just trying to be cool? <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I see it. It's that they're trying to be smart. They 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 see themselves as having these great ideas, mm -hmm. which, when it comes down to it, aren't really that great. And but they they write in such a way that they appear to be very smart because they they are like massive intellects. But they're so massively intellectual that a their work doesn't make sense to most people, and. Well, B, it makes pretty much makes sense only to them because whenever their critics try to understand it, then they can always point out how their critics misunderstand them mm -hmm. because it's mis it's not understandable. Um, and it even gets to the point where what was it like one of the one of the postmodernists, I think it might even it might even be like a modern postmodernist says that to even attempt to come up with a definition of postmodernism, like would not would make it not postmodern so it has to be undefinable so you you get trapped in just this realm of like utter subjectivity and the inability to know anything it's totally anti epistemological mm -hmm. can't know anything you can't even define what postmodern is postmodern what postmodernism is because to attempt to define it would be to use one of a modernist a modernistic tool of reason and rationality to try to explain um this something so it's it's just like this totally abstract creation that has very little um connection with the actual world but when you when you like s strip away all of that like over the top complexity and intellectualism like i said you can find some some decent stuff some things that actually make sense but it's just mm -hmm. so bogged down with this arcane like baroque reasoning and language that mm -hmm. you know well why bother even reading it is where I'm, kind of where i'm yeah. at it's like, they were they came up with some interesting ideas and some good criticisms and then got self-important or let their self-importance get the better of them and then they just kept devolving down further mm -hmm. and getting more entrenched in it and then here we are it reminds me of uh, i was taking a class on uh study of religions in university and we were working through a textbook the textbook was basically all the different approaches to the study of religion um like in the academy over you know generations so um, you, we had sociological perspectives and psychological perspectives and historical and etc cetera, etc cetera. and then finally near the end of the book we get to we only had i think like one lecture left and so the professor a couple of lectures left but the professor gave, gave us a choice okay do you guys want to do the postmodernism chapter or the feminism chapter and we're all and so the majority of us chose oh we want to do the postmodern one and he's he's like okay so you know he gives his lecture the next class and he's like so i'm so i bet you wanted to you, i bet now you would have liked to have done the feminist one <laughs> huh? and we all agreed because the feminist one actually made a lot more sense than the postmodernist one like the postmodernist one is just totally off the wall it's totally ridiculous but that's what the kids like these days i guess right? that's what they liked in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and 90s and now foucault is like the most cited scholar ever which is quite funny but anyways that's cynical theories next one live not by lies we interviewed rod dreyer on the show so um include a link to that because there we pretty much say everything that needs to be said about this one recommended now 
We haven't really talked about this one on the show, I don't think. But I was looking through it and just looking looking through my notes for it the other day. Um, so I wanted to mention it. Coddling of the American Mind. We've mentioned Jonathan Haidt before. Wrote this with Greg Lukianoff. How good intentions, there it is again, and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. So this is primarily inspired by and and about the situation in universities these days. What's going on in the universities? Um, because there's a lot of crazy, crazy stuff that's been going on for the past 10 years or so, which has roots going back even further, and you can you know trace it back to the postmodernists and the critical theorists and all that fun stuff. But this is just, uh, there's so much in this book about what's going on. What's great about it is... It's kind of presented in the um, in the context of cognitive behavioral therapy, so which is one of the most effective forms of therapy out there for people de- dealing with actual like emotional and emotional problems and issues, and kind of the the nutshell view of it is that what's going on in the universities, the way that, and not just the universities, but in the wider culture, is. It's almost like anti-psychotherapy. All of the principles that work for how to deal with stress or phobias or um, aggression, negative emotions, all the things that actually work to get rid of those, the, the universities and social justice theory and practice do the opposite. It actually makes things worse. So it's not a matter of, uh, a matter of in the case of, dealing with a fear of exposing yourself to that fear to overcome it and to, 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 um, what's the word? Like get, well, get used to it. Inoculate. Inoculate. No, it's when you progressively, progressively, progressively get more and more used to something. Um, can't think of the word, but so you expose, expose yourself. You know, if you're scared of spiders, you know, you have it 20 feet away, 15, 10, let it touch you, you know, et cetera, and you get closer and closer until you, and at each step you, you deal with it and, and uh, aren't overcome by your fear to the point where you can carry a spider in your hand and you're not afraid of it. But in our culture, it's, no, put it even further away. Let's all, let's all get together and scream and make it go further away. And that screaming, that screeching makes makes it uh makes you even more even more afraid more intolerant and have even more negative emotions which is probably not the safest and best thing to do so if you haven't read this book I highly recommend it i i like jonathan Haidt's book previous book the righteous mind too but i'll just give an idea of some of the ideas in here um part one deals with three bad ideas three untruths as they call them the untruth of fragility, that what what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. The untruth of emotional reasoning, always trust your feelings. The untruth of us versus them, that life is a battle between good people and evil people. So these those are the kind of like some three fundamental aspects of a worldview that, well, the worldview that is prevalent in university culture and, well, everywhere now. And... Along the way, just a lot of great stuff, um, but it ends with prescriptions for what can be done about it, you know, how to have better universities, how to raise kids better, because um, parenting practices contribute a lot to this, including, um, you know, the decline of play, the bureaucracy of safetyism, um, just good stuff. And while looking through here, I noticed that uh, there's a few good mentions of Marcuse that didn't stick out to me when I originally read it. Maybe I'll, I'll read that. Yeah, so I'm going to read something that they have from uh, from Regressive Tolerance. Yeah, I'll read a couple paragraphs. Marcuse recognized that, he was ad- that what he was advocating seemed to violate both the spirit of democracy and the liberal tradition of non-discrimination. But he argued that when the majority of a society is being repressed... It is justifiable to use repression and indoctrination to allow the, quote, subversive majority to achieve the power that it deserves. In a chilling passage that foreshadows events on some campuses today, Marcuse 
argued that true democracy might require denying basic rights to people who advocate for conservative causes or for policies he viewed as aggressive or discriminatory, and that true freedom of thought might require professors to indoctrinate their students. Here's the quote from Marcuse. The way should not be blocked by which a subversive majority could develop, and if they are blocked by organized repression and indoctrination, their reopening may require apparently undemocratic means. They would include the withdrawal of toleration of speech and assembly from groups and movements which promote aggressive policies, armament, chauvinism, discrimination on the grounds of race and religion, or which oppose the extension of public services, social security, Medicare, medical care, etc. Moreover, the restoration of freedom of thought may necessitate new and rigid restrictions on teachings and practices in the educational institutions, which, by their very methods and concepts, serve to enclose the mind within the established universe of discourse and behavior. And I don't think they include the quote here, but in that same essay, <coughs> Marcuse essentially says that, like explicitly, that the implication of all of this is that we have to be totally tolerant of everything on the left and totally repressive of everything on the right. So the the logical um, conclusion, the logical implication of that is that anything on the left which includes violence should be tolerated, which includes violence should be tolerated. Anything on the right, even if it isn't violent or extremist, cannot be tolerated because it will inevitably lead to violence and, and bad stuff. So he sets up... <laughs> Because the because the right inevitably leads to totalitarianism and, and fascism and all these things, that means that the left should be totalitarian and fascism to make sure that totalitarian and fascism never come about. That's essentially the logic of Marcuse. Which is <laughs> just very comical. Um, but there was something in there that he... Oh, shoot. What was it? Um... More crazy stuff that Marcuse said? Is that possible? <laughs> is it possible? I don't know. But it is... Uh, yeah, so it's a... Like, I don't know how you can... Well, he said it nevertheless, but uh, the idea of needing this repressive organ to stamp out certain speech in order to protect free speech undermines free speech so it can't really be called protection of free speech because you're whittling it away mm -hmm. uh and that's another one of those like aspects that's you know spread into the wider culture of shutting things down that you don't like uh and you could say you know you have good intentions for it because you know you you want to shut down the the white supremacists because you don't want more white supremacists but that's not actually the way that you get people not only to not become white supremacists, but mm -hmm. also to also to convert away from white supremacism. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've talked about the the example of what was his name, the the black jazz player. Uh, was he a bassist? I think. Piano player. Piano player. Uh, oh, uh, I forget his name. Yeah, I can't remember his name either. But <laughs> again, <laughs> where he went to, uh, you know white Klansmen meetings and sat there and befriended these people. And just by simply as a black man, giving them and showing them respect and talking to them uh, and uh, engaging with them as if they're human beings, he was able to convert some of the heads of the, of the clan away from, you know, white supremacism. So, obviously the way forward is to give them a voice to to let them air their grievances, to let them share their opinions, and then, you know, let other people understand where they're coming from and what they have to say so that way they can critique it themselves, realize how ridiculous it is, and, you know, move on, as opposed to, you know, further putting it uh, into the dark corners where then it gets its own justification. Because it's like, see, we're being repressed. That means we're obviously right. And so then, you know, they attract more people and then they become more of a problem. So they're actually creating the problems that they say that they're trying to solve by creating their problems. Mm -hmm.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Just two more. Just two more books. <laughs> this one. Okay. We haven't actually talked about this book on the show before. Snakes and Suits, Understanding and Surviving the Psychopaths in Your Office by Paul Babiak and Robert Hare. This book also came out several years ago, but this is the new revised edition. It just came out in 2019. Um, this is about corporate psychopaths. So it was one of the first books to talk about non-criminal psychopaths. Cleckley, you know, the original, the original Cleckley, uh, the uh, greatest of all time, the, the, OG. the OG, he talked about psychiatric, primarily psychiatric psychopaths, so people encountered in uh, psychiatric institutions. And, and Hare, in his first book, Hare, of course, is the guy that developed the standard test for psychopathy, the psychopathy checklist. Um, his first book in the mid-90s, 99, um, focused on forensic populations, so criminal psychopaths, psychopaths that were in prison, essentially. And this book, so this book was the first one to be focused primarily on psychopaths in a non, non-forensic uh, population, so in the corporate workplace. So just for that you know, reason alone, it's worth reading because psychopaths are not just serial killers or uh you know violent criminals that there there are psychopaths on wall street and in corporations and um and this book is a good uh, good introduction just to that con just to that concept and it's kind of been updated with a whole bunch of the the latest research and and stuff to come out since this was originally published in 2006 so also worth reading. Um, is there anything else I wanted to say about this? Just that, well, it's Im- it's important because, as we say every show, <laughs> as, we, as we do every day, um, Stimpy or, no, no, what's the, Pinky. Uh, pinky. pinky. Yes. What pinky are we doing today, Brain? Yeah, same thing we, every, we do every day. We are pointing out that psychopaths are really important, and especially to all these things that we're talking about, that psychopathy is instrumental and an essential part of what's going on with Antifa, what went on with the communists, what's going on with critical theory, you know, what's going on in the universities, um, and why, you know, Rod Dreher had to write a book like Live Not By Lies is that, is, you know, why was such a thing necessary in Eastern Europe? Why, why were things so bad that people needed to have um, you know, these groups where they could actually talk about, in this case, religion and, and have a, 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 like a, a sense of solidarity with, with someone within, the, within the society in Eastern Europe because of th- this is the, the influence and the, the kind of the, the reach of psychopathy and what it does to people, not only what it does to people, but what it, what it can do to an entire country or wider than an entire country, an entire empire is it has profound psychological effects on the people around them. Um, so, and th- this is the, this is true on all scales, whether it's interpersonally one on one. If you have an encounter with a psychopath, whether in the workplace or not, that's why you know this book is 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 essential to to because if you haven't had that experience, to see what it's like, to see what goes on, to see what it is in uh, a modern you know corporate example. Of course, it can happen in a in a relationship, a romantic relationship, or a family member, or any other, you know, any other interpersonal relationship, but that dynamic and the effect on the, like the the traumatic effect, the the stress effect on the the person involved, translates and scales to a, a macro social level. To it can scale to and can and does scale to an entire society in certain circumstances. So. That's why you should read uh, Snakes and Suits. And did you have anything to say on that one, Adam? Uh, n- no. No? Okay. Then the last one. This is kind of the, the odd one out in this in these books, but because it was published 
a couple of years ago, and I really like it. I'll mention it. So in order to understand what has been going on on the geopolitical level, and uh, yeah, so geopolitical, the wars we've been involved in that are still ongoing, the conflicts in the world, and the, let's say, the last four years of accusations, <laughs> let's put it that way, Ukraine Over the Edge, Russia, the West, and the New Cold War by Gordon M. Hahn. Back on our old show, we interviewed uh, Gordon about some of his previous books. Um, he's written two books on um, basically Islamist philosophy in Russia, in Chechnya and Dagestan. And so his, his first book on that subject was um, on terrorism in Russia. And the second book was on the, the Caucasus Emirate Mujahideen. So this was the basically the group of jihadists in in Russia that developed over the years after the kind of during but mostly after the the Chechen war in the late 90s and eventually declared themselves uh well they declared a an, the, the Caucasus Emirate, you know, basically the an, an Islamic state in uh in Chechnya and or Dagestan or one or the other and declared uh, loyalty to al-Baghdadi and joined ISIS and went down into, into Syria and Iraq. So his book was on them and, and their organization and how, how that all played out and how they eventually went to, to Syria. But this book is, and he's a Russia expert, so this book is all about um, primarily the, the history of the conflict in Ukraine, everything leading up to the conflict in Ukraine, um, the revolution coup in 2014 all the circumstances surrounding that and it's so i'd say if you don't really know what or you or if you think you know what was going on in in ukraine and what's been going on with russia for the past five years or longer six se seven seven years well longer than that then read this book because it's got all the background and han knows what he's talking about and there's also so this has got like, it's not just current events, it's got history, um, kind of like the entire history of, uh, in summary form, of Ukraine and what's the, and Ukraine, relations with Russia, um, relations between the, the West and Russia, explaining, um, well, just explaining everything that's going on. And one of the advantages, the way that it does, does relate to um, previous books that we've been talking about, is there's one section in here Describing the, um, describing the, the neo-Nazi ideology in Ukraine, groups like Right Sector, um, Pravi Sector, and their history and what they're up to and all that kind of stuff. And so, in a, in a short chapter, it's kind of like, um, similar kind of look as No gives to Antifa in the first book we mentioned. So when, and it's, it's great, it's great to read as a kind of contrast when you, so when you see talk about the, the far right in the United States, which oftentimes just means anyone, uh, anyone to the right of Karl Marx, um, then, and you compare individuals who are called far right, like Andy No. Jordan Peterson, <laughs> you know, anyone like that, and compare them to what an actual far right group looks like what they actually think, what they actually do. Um, and of course there are some guys, there are some people like that in the States, of course, you know, but just not very many, but to see, to see what the, to, to see what they're actually like, to see what's actually going on in Ukraine, who happened to be the people that the U S government supported in the coup in Ukraine in 2014, kind of it's a bit of an eye opener. And if, especially when you combine that with what was going on in Syria, what has been, what went on for many years in Syria, the types of groups that, you know, the U.S. and the West were supporting in Syria. What is it about, uh, you know, the U.S. you know military and intelligence supporting far right and Islamist groups in foreign countries to overthrow the governments there? It, you know, it's kind of it's. It's, it's an it's interesting <laughs> development that they keep 
like yeah. you said, they just keep supporting all of these like primary ponderogenic unions. It's very strange, and they take over you know wide swaths of areas and mm -hmm. and uh, infiltrate governments and you know wreck nations. Uh, it's just interesting that they just keep doing that over and over. And you know here they are supporting Antifa and Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. uh, critical theory and you know supporting all of the most insane things I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. um, it's just interesting. It makes you wonder, you know? Yeah, I think there's something going on there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think that's enough. That That's plenty of books to read. Yeah. You know, you should, our, all of you viewers should have that done by next week, I suppose, so. By tomorrow. Yeah. Now we'll give them a week. Seven books, one a day. It's doable. So uh, with that said, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you get some reading done. And we will be back next week with another show. So take care, everyone.